The famous John D. Rockefeller, who represented the American dream, or more fittingly, the American scheme, he was born into a family that, to put it kindly, didn't have much money. Rockefeller's story starts in 1839, his father, known as Devil Bill, was a unique man. He tried his hand at many things but excelled at none, often leaving his family to chase the next big scheme. We are talking about a man getting a bear as a prize just because, and then teaching it to do tricks. Devil Bill wasn't just unusual. He was a living, breathing paradox now, in this rags-to-riches tale. Let's not overlook young John's early entrepreneurial spirit. He wasn't just a farmhand and student. He was a budding capitalist, even as a child, raising turkeys from stolen eggs. That's not just resourcefulness. It's a glimpse into the mindset of a future tycoon who would stop at nothing to make a profit. Rockefeller's father's colorful life included accusations of sexual assault and bigamy. Did this shape young Rockefeller's views on ethics and morality? Perhaps. But one thing's for certain, it left him as the de facto head of the household, burdening him with responsibilities that would age any normal child. But then, John D. Rockefeller was anything but normal. Fast forward to Rockefeller's teenage years, where his dreams of higher education were quashed by the harsh reality of needing to support his family. This twist of fate led him to the bustling streets of Cleveland. In search of a job that would pave the way to his future empire, his perseverance paid off, and he landed a job as a bookkeeper. Here, he got his first taste of real business, and it was intoxicating young Rockefeller opening his employer's safe to hold a $4,000 check. Mesmerized by its value, this moment wasn't just about the money. It was a symbol of the power and prestige he yearned for, and with a paltry salary of 50 cents a day, he was far from it. But not for long, now, here's where the story takes a turn. The Civil War erupts, and while Rockefeller's moral compass points north, his financial compass sees an opportunity. Opting out of military service to keep his business afloat might raise some eyebrows. But then again, Rockefeller was never one to let sentimentality get in the way of opportunity. His first venture with Maurice Clark in the food business was just the beginning. But let's not sugarcoat it. The so-called smart way to solve their capital problem was nothing short of cunning. Manipulation, they inflated their worth to secure loans. A move that might raise ethical questions but proved effective in the cutthroat world of business. As the Civil War raged on, Rockefeller's business thrived. The inflation of food prices may have been a nightmare for the average Joe, but for Rockefeller, it was a dream come true. His produce business wasn't just surviving, it was flourishing, making him a small fortune, but then. The plot thickens with the introduction of black gold, the oil industry was booming, and Rockefeller, ever the opportunist, didn't just dip his toes in, he dove headfirst, partnering with Samuel Andrews. He entered the oil refining business, capitalizing on Andrews' innovative sulfuric acid technique to purify crude oil. This wasn't just a business move. It was a strategic play that would set the stage for his future domination of the oil industry. Setting up the oil refinery was, as they say, remarkably simple, which is the kind of understatement you'd expect when talking about a venture that was about to turn the economic world on its head, kerosene. The refined darling of the oil world sold like hot cakes, outshining its crude ancestor with the grace of a ballet dancer in a mosh pit. John, ever the astute observer, couldn't turn a blind eye to the dazzling numbers that the refinery was pulling in. Within a year, yes, just a single trip around the sun, this side hustle had become the golden goose, in a move that screamed all in. John and his partner Maurice tossed their old business aside like yesterday's newspaper, diving headfirst into the oil frenzy, but, oh, the fickleness of oil, the supply was as stable as a house of cards in a wind tunnel, with the only known source being a tiny speck in Pennsylvania, where optimists were as rare as a polite conversation about politics every time oil was discovered. Towns sprouted up like mushrooms, only to vanish just as quickly leaving behind nothing but stories and empty whiskey bottles. The market was a roller coaster, prices fluctuating from laughably low to eye-wateringly high. To say it was turbulent is like saying the Titanic had a minor water problem. John, in a stroke of what he probably thought was genius, decided to stick to refining oil, steering clear of the unpredictable world of oil mining, however. The situation for John and Maurice was like a high-stakes poker game where the rules kept changing. 
When oil was abundant, prices tanked and their profits shriveled up when it was scarce. They paced their offices, fretting that the last drop of oil had been siphoned from the earth. The stress was too much for Maurice, who in 1865 decided to tap out. Selling his share to John for what today would be a small fortune, Maurice cashed out. While John doubled down on this oil roulette, then, as if the universe had a twisted sense of humor, a massive new oil field was discovered. Turning John's fears into fairy dust, still, the market was as cutthroat as a season finale of a reality TV show if John wanted to swim in his Scrooge McDuck-style money pool. He needed to crush his competition under his boot like an unwanted cigarette. Then Henry Flagler comes in. He is John's new partner, and like John, he doesn't just want a small part. He wants everything. Henry is very similar to John, but even tougher. They began forming alliances that were as friendly to their competitors as a fox in a hen house. One particularly sneaky move was their secret deal with the railroads, securing transportation costs that made their competitors' eyes water. This deal turned Cleveland into the oil refining capital. Much to the chagrin of anyone not named John D. Rockefeller, the competitors, oblivious to the secret rebates, were playing a game they couldn't win. John, with a wolfish grin, triggered a price war. Knowing his costs were lower, competitors either went bankrupt or sold their souls, I mean, businesses, to Standard Oil. John knew these railroad rebates were morally gray at best. But in the Wild West of industrial America, legality was a fluid concept. This strategy was effective, albeit brutal, turning Standard Oil into a money-making behemoth. However, with the oil surplus driving prices down, John feared the entire industry might collapse under its own weight. So, what's a ruthless businessman to do? Why? Form an even more dominant monopoly, of course. This led to the creation of the South Improvement Company, a name so bland it could be a brand of vanilla ice cream. This alliance, which included the biggest railroads and refiners, was about as popular as a skunk at a garden party when the public caught wind of it. Protests erupted, featuring hijacked shipments and torn up train tracks despite this setback. John wasn't deterred. He knew if he couldn't control the industry through shadowy deals, he'd do it in the open with all the subtlety of a sledgehammer. During the so-called Cleveland Massacre, he coerced 22 of the 26 oil refining companies in the city into selling to him for peanuts. John's empire expanded, now equipped with the latest technology and the brightest minds in the industry, by 1873, John had monopolized the Cleveland refineries but then came Black Thursday, a day of financial reckoning that saw bank failures and economic turmoil, yet. This tale isn't just about the rise of a business titan, it's a narrative steeped in ambition, cunning, and a touch of moral ambiguity. It's a story that reminds us that behind every great fortune lies a great crime or at least a few questionable business practices, so, once robust and unyielding, the United States economy finds itself in the throes of a six-year recession. It's like watching a marathon runner suddenly trip over their own shoelaces and why, not due to an excessive oil, but a comical lack of demand. The image of Standard Oil's refining plants in Cleveland, operating at a third of their capacity, is almost pitiful in its own right, but wait, there's a twist. Oil prices plummeted to the laughable price of 48 cents per barrel, cheaper than water. You could almost picture the miners, railroad magnates, and refiners, once kings of their domains, staring blankly at their crumbling empires. Bankruptcy loomed over them like a cartoon anvil, ready to drop. Yet, amidst this financial Armageddon, there stood John D. Rockefeller, calm as a cat with nine lives, thanks to Standard Oil's shrew. Financial management and state-of-the-art refineries, crisis, opportunity, more like. In John's eyes, he must have felt like a chess grandmaster, seeing the board in a way no one else could. John already had Cleveland in his pocket, but why stop there? The entire nation was his for the taking, other refineries, drowning in their financial woes, were ripe for the picking. John, in his infinite wisdom, decides this is the perfect moment to extend his empire, and oh, the tactics he used buying up all refining machinery and barrels, hoarding railroad. Reservations, it's almost comical in its villainy. It's as if John was playing Monopoly, but with real trains and real barrels. His competitors, in a cruel twist of fate, found themselves squeezed out, not with a bang, but a whimper, selling their businesses for pennies on the dollar, the aftermath. 
Standard Oil, now a behemoth, controlled more than half of Pittsburgh's refining capacity, not to mention the largest refineries in Philadelphia and a dominant position in New York. And let's not forget the pipelines, those sprawling tentacles. Turning Standard Oil into a veritable octopus, it's as if John looked at the railroads, once kings of transportation, and said, cute, but watch this by this point. Rockefeller wasn't just the king of oil refining, he was a titan, a juggernaut of wealth and power. But, as we all know, every titan has his Achilles heel, Standard Oil's. Ruthless tactics had not gone unnoticed, their reputation. Let's just say it was less than stellar. The biggest newspaper in America back then labeled them the most heartless, bold, merciless, and greedy monopoly that ever took hold of a country. That's quite a statement, don't you think? Then came the railroad companies, especially the Pennsylvania Railroad under the strong leadership of Tom Scott. Scott, always up for a challenge, begins to construct his own oil, refineries, John. In a petty and mean-spirited move, wages a fierce battle against the Pennsylvania Railroad. This was more than just business, it was a personal feud. The fallout caused job losses, reduced wages, and one of the most violent labor strikes in the history of the United States. It seemed like John, in his pursuit of power, unknowingly set off a bomb. In a dramatic turn of events, the Pennsylvania Railroad, once a Goliath, succumbed to the David that was standard oil. John, ever the strategist, didn't just defeat his enemy, he absorbed them. The result, Standard Oil wasn't just a part of the oil industry. It was the oil industry with a near monopolistic control over refining, but the plot thickens. Enter Andrew Carnegie, the steel magnate, who viewed John's victory over his mentor, Tom Scott, as a personal affront. Thus, a rivalry was born, the king of oil versus the king of steel. It's the stuff of legends, really, despite all this. John D. Rockefeller remained an enigma. He amassed unparalleled wealth and power but lived a life of relative simplicity. He played with his children instead of hobnobbing with the elite, a stark contrast to his public persona as a ruthless industrialist. Yet, as the world changed around him with the advent of electricity and new oil discoveries, Standard Oil found itself at another crossroads, but John, ever the opportunist, saw this not as a threat but as yet another chance to evolve and dominate. It's almost as if he thrived on chaos, turning tumultuous times into golden opportunities. 